who have not seen you yet believe. Make us worthy to celebrate this new Sunday with joy and with gladness, and prepare us and our departed for that joyful and eternal feast, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your living Holy Spirit forever.
reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of all and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners upon this parish, and your children forever. <clears throat> and therefore, since we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade others. But we are clearly apparent before God, and I hope that we also are apparent before your consciousness. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but we give you an opportunity to boast of us, so that you may have something to say to those who boast of mere external appearance rather than of the heart. For if we are out of our minds, this is for God. And if we are rational, this is for you. For the charity of Christ compels us. And once we have come to the conviction that one has died for all, therefore all have died. He indeed died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake has died and was raised up. Consequently, from now on we regard, we regard no one according to the flesh. And even if we once knew Christ according to the flesh, we now know him so no longer. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation, and the old things have passed away. And behold, new things have come. And all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. So we implore you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For your sake he made him to be sin, who did not know sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the Gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the 
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Saint John, who proclaimed life unto the world. Let us listen to the proclamation of life in salvation for our souls. The Apostle John writes, Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and he stood in their midst, and he said to them, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Place your finger here, and see my hands. Bring your hand, and put it into my side. And be no longer unbelieving, but believe. And Thomas answered, and he said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, You have come to believe because you have seen me. The blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. This is the truth, peace be with you. famous for his eloquence. So he's contemporary with the time of the great sun king, Louis XIV. Pomposity, largeness, regalness, all of this aspect. But one of the most away in his sermons, and his sermons are all recorded and they are print printed still to this day. But one of the things that Bosuet says is the book of the apocalypse, the book of Revelation, is the gospel of the risen Christ. Which is an interesting thing to say. A lot of people these days think of the book of the Apocalypse as being something about the future. But in fact, the book of the Apocalypse is about the present and the future, and to some degree also the past. And clearly what it is, is the Apocalypse is about the risen Lamb. It is the exaltation of the Lamb of God. You see that reference to Lamb in last week's liturgy. You have it in references, of obviously, all around this Easter season, of our Lord being the Lamb of God. And the Lamb being exalted introduces something into time which destabilizes the tranquility of a sinful and fallen world. The world is tranquil in its sin. It excuses its mediocrity. It makes excuses for the sins that it makes. You know this. You are on social media. It is what the world does. It finds itself quite, quite good in many ways. And so in its choices, it continues on and it's the same spirit. But with the exaltation of the Lamb, by the resurrection of our Lord, as St. Paul says in the epistle today, all things are made new. And what he introduces into the world is an entire new history, an entire new program that is in him and from him, and therefore what it does is destabilizes the fallen world. That is reparation, that is redemption that is being offered to the world, but it destabilizes. The same way that either in our own conversion or perhaps the people around you relative to your own life, they're disturbed. If you really intentionally try to pursue virtue, it's just hard, it's not easy to do, and in the modern world, it's even more difficult. And so when we, this introduces it, you wind up causing oftentimes strife. That sister of yours who really thinks you're kind of annoying because you insist on the daily rosary or something like this. 
that type of a thing. We have that experience. And of course, in a cosmic level, this is the resurrection of the Lamb. This is the exaltation of the Lamb. It's in the very beginning of the book of the Apocalypse in chapter 5. The Lamb that stands, as it were, slain. The simultaneity of death and resurrection. This reality, then, is introduced into this world, and it destabilizes the world of the dragon. The world that is governed by the dragon. Our Lord makes reference to this before his arrest. But the prince of this world is already cast out, and he has nothing in me. And so what St. Paul is doing here, I give you this introduction because what St. Paul is doing in this section of the second letter to the Corinthians is he's using a number of images. Here we have clearly, he says, we are ambassadors of God. And we are therefore, as it were, God making an appeal through us. We are representing his divine majesty. And we are inciting and calling you to be reconciled to God. Find this union with the divine lamb, the exaltation of the lamb, the risen lamb, and no longer continue in the fallen world governed by the dragon. That conflict, he, in another point shortly after this, he will say, we are co-workers with God. We are co-laborers with God. It is God who sends down his grace, God who plants, and we nurture the field, the vineyard of the Lord. We work on this in order to bring about this development and flourishing of grace. This is one of the things that's also very clear, especially in the Eastern churches. That the divine liturgy, the mysteries, the sacraments, these are not things about me, what I get, the forgiveness of my sins, the anointing when I am in danger of death, um, the Eucharist. It's not about my communion. These mysteries are the amplification and extension of that risen Lamb into the world, transforming the entire cosmos. So every time you are present in a sacrament, even if it's just you and the confessional and the Lord God, it is a cosmic moment because you are introducing into that world a victory over the dragon and the fallen valley of tears. It's important for us to remember that. So when we go to Mass, when we go, we assist at liturgy, we are being invited to enter into a cosmic reality that is a triumph of the Christ of which we are meant to be transformed and become vehicles of that transformation on a cosmic level. That is why your sister is annoyed that you say the daily rosary. It has nothing to do with the rosary. She probably could care less. But you're introducing, saying that you can go beyond something. We can always become better. We can always become more virtuous because is the gospel, is it not, in fact, the imitation of Christ? That's our moral obligation, the pursuit of holiness, the pursuit of virtue, the pursuit of sanctity. That aspect in the imitation of Christ means there's never going to be a moment when I'm saying I'm good, I'm just like Jesus. No one is ever going to be able to say that, not I, not you, no one, which is why it's an ongoing process because ultimately it's not even about my individual life or all of our lives put together. It is about the cosmic triumph, the universal triumph of God's divine love over all things. And so liturgy is a transformation at that level. It happens at moment to moment. We do this on Sunday mornings. We do this each morning, 9, 9, 11 on Sundays. There is a moment in which we stop in this valley of tears and we enter into a current of the gospel, of the risen Lamb, of the risen Christ. When we understand it from that point, then we understand why St. Paul says in this writing today, the charity of Christ compels us. We are compelled when we realize that one died for all of us. That charity, that response to see God's love for us compels us to act, compels us to respond. Again, unfortunately in human life, we've often, probably ourselves, had the own experience of having someone in the family or a friend for whom we've done kind things, that we've gone out of our way to help and to aid. And what do we get? Sometimes we're just ignored. Sometimes we're insulted. Because a lot of people resent when you do good things for them. So they figure out something to nitpick about. Or to kind of disparage you on something else to put down what you've done that's good. 
This is the perspective of God. St. Paul says, when we understand what God has done for us, and what it means that the one who knew no sin whatsoever became sin, so that we can become righteousness in Him, that we can become justice in Him. This blows every, all the fuses, everything goes. And he says, for that reason, the charity of God compels us. Our life is transformed when we understand what God is trying to accomplish. We are being asked in one generation, for one moment, in one life, each of us individually, to be part of this projection of divine charity throughout all of creation. That is an extraordinary thing. This is why St. Paul is using the image of ambassadors of God, co-workers with God, all of this aspect of transformation to understand what are the mysteries, what are the sacraments, what is this reality that God is allowing us to participate in. He asks us, he never forces us, Hell is the place of freedom, of people who chose themselves first, middle, and end. They're all free, and they're all in destruction because of their freedom that they misused. Heaven? Heaven are the people who came to realize the radiance of charity and love in their existence, and they responded accordingly. Humbly first on your knees before that divine love. We respond love for love, and then we realize I have to do something. This is the pursuit of holiness. This is the pursuit of virtue. This is the reparation for my sins. This is the changing of my life. This is my conversion. These things are not there because of a fear of hell. They are there because the individual comes to realize the love of God. That's what conversion is. Conversion is not about fear. It's about love. And it's about a realization of love. And when we don't realize that charity, we do nothing. Sometimes we resent it. God keeps trying to make me better than I want to be. It's like your children, the whole time they're growing up, right? You're always trying to make them into adults and they want to stay four. But you're trying to make them six and then you try to make them eight and then you try to make them 12. And then it really becomes fast and furious over those last years of adolescence because you're trying to make them adults who stand on their feet. And none of us really like that. And so we move in these directions. And so on that natural level, we can understand. But it's the same thing St. Paul says for us on the supernatural level. That's why he says the one who is in union with Christ is a new creation. You are being made anew. You are being transformed inside out. Which is why the process of conversion is often painful. As we've often said, it makes us go places that one, we never expected, and two, that when we can foresee them, sometimes we really don't want to go. And yet, the charity of Christ compels us. It moves us in that direction. And when we understand that, then we see this triumph of the Lamb, the exaltation of the Lamb that's in the book of Revelation, is the introduction to something into the fallen world and the dominion of the dragon that causes agitation in the world of the dragon, but brings light and glory to everything else. And so you have in the vision of the book of the Apocalypse, the thousands upon thousands, the martyrs under the, martyrs under the altar, the thousands upon thousands that worship God and ask for this to go more quickly, accelerate this, bring the fulfillment of judgment to its full glory now. Why? The, the martyrs under the altar keep saying, how long do we have to wait for this? That's the charity of Christ compels us. So, as I always encourage you, go back and read the fuller section of the second letter to the Corinthians. And understand what God is actually asking of us. When St. Paul, after calling himself an ambassador, he says, therefore, I plead with you, be reconciled with God. Find the greater perfection with that charity of Christ and become the new creation you are meant to be. This is the beauty and the reality of grace and conversion of resurrection that we participate in. So on this day we pray in the Husoyo that like Thomas, who was a man who really didn't want to move forward, did he? His apostles told him, the women told him, his fellow colleagues told him, we've seen the Lord. Nah, nah, nah. Not if I touch, if I got to see myself. And he's rebuked for it. 
So he's being drawn somewhere that he does not want to really go because he wants his judgment only to be himself. That's why he falls. That's why in the Masmoral, beautifully, it says, I have sinned. Grant me forgiveness. I have been too fearful. I have been too hesitant. I have been too reticent. And I have not pursued the life of goodness and of virtue and of holiness that I should have chosen. And so when our Lord says to St. Thomas, he says, because you've seen me, you believed. But blessed, truly blessed are those who haven't needed and who haven't insisted on seeing and touching and yet who believe. And so we've noticed that in the Husoyo, the grace that we ask for today is that we ourselves, in our own generation, become witnesses to that resurrection and follow in the footsteps of St. Thomas as witnesses to the resurrection and perhaps follow in his footsteps to some extent of our own hesitation, our own reticence, and our own dislike of where God may be taking us. And we ask that the charity of Christ truly compel us and propel us into a vision of the exalted Lamb and bring the holiness about in our lives freely that we choose because the love of God has made us do so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.
and sisters, now we see these offerings that your children have brought to you, out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life in your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the, ch the Chosen One, Saint Mary, and Saint Jude, and Saint Bernadette. Be mindful, O God, of the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the intentions of all the members of this parish. Be mindful also of all those who share with us today. Instituted for our salvation, 
not be for our condemnation. Rather, may it blot out all our sins, forgive our faults, and be an expression of our thanks for your goodness. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God, the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. Truly, it is right and just to glorify You, bless You, praise You, and adore You, and give You thanks, O Maker of all things, visible and invisible. The highest heavens and all its powers praise you, the sun, the moon, and all the stars, the earth, the seas, and all that is in them, the heavenly Jerusalem, and the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The angels, archangels, and heavenly hosts all sing, praising your majestic glory with triumphant hymns, with never-ending voices, and with sweet acclamations. They cry out and they proclaim. Holy, 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 we had transgressed your commandment and fell. You did not abandon us, but like a good and merciful Father, you instructed us. Through the law you called out to us, through the prophets you guided us, and at the appointed time you sent your Son, our Lord and God Jesus Christ, into the world to renew your image. He came down and by the Holy Spirit became flesh of the Holy and ever Virgin Mary, and dwelt among us, accomplishing all things for our salvation. Kyrie eleison. Tu abiamo hadaktum hashodi leima vetaye, en sabe lachamina kori shanto obarach. of 
sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your glory is a King coming, when you shall judge the world with justice, and reward all people according to their deeds. Now we ask you, do not repay us according to our sins and transgressions, but in your compassion and love for all people, cleanse us of all our sins. We your people and your inheritance implore you and through you and with you, implore your Father, saying, ever 
Pure Virgin Mary, the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, St. John, the forerunner, St. Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, St. James, the brother of the Lord, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Bernadette, and all the saints. In your grace, count us among them in the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers who spread the word of truth in your holy church and preach your Son, Jesus Christ, to all nations. Through their prayers, grant peace to your church and confirm their teachings in our souls. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Be mindful, O God, of all spiritual and earthly beings, of the faithful departed who have died in the true faith. Grant them rest and do not take their faults into account. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is with us in we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. But the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now, now and forever. Shlomo 
Oh Lord, we bow our heads before you, awaiting your abundant mercy. Send your blessings upon us and sanctify us so that we may become worthy to share in your holy mysteries. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mercy and his love for all people. You are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Amen. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy God, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, bless me.
We thank you, O oh God the Father, for your great and indescribable love for our people. Since you have made us worthy to share in your heavenly banquet and in your Holy Spirit, do not forsake us for having received your holy mysteries, but keep us in the radiance of holiness and righteousness with the saints. May we obtain a share in the heavenly reward through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. Amen. Shlomo Elokhodna. <laughs>